Mississippi, and we've been at a uh, uh, what's called the Home Missions Conference, and it's really just for churches that are just getting started and getting going. And you know, uh, there's some things you never really recognize in yourself, like you know, my wife and I and son and and everybody here. You know, we're a small group. We're just small, so there's a lot of strength and energy that goes out because we're it. We're we're the ones we rely on, right? And so you don't really recognize sometimes how drained you become, you know, doing everything. So we went down to that conference, and I'll tell you, for uh, started on Tuesday and then Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, and I will tell you, I have, I felt like I've been eating steak dinner in the spirit realm for four days, and, and um, man, it was good. But I'll tell you, I left there with one desire, and I, I don't, I even had to go to the Lord and talk to him about this and just say, Lord, I don't know how to do this. Um, But dying out in the flesh, dying to a place, Christ died, and and my desire is to be like Jesus. And so I'm not wanting to jump off a cliff or anything like that. But I want to die out in the flesh so that he can live in me and through me and so that others can see him. I, I believe the church... I believe the Bible's true, and the Bible says this, that for the believers, these signs are going to follow, that, that they're going to cast out devils, they're going to speak with new tongues, they're going to lay hands upon the sick. It, it, great and marvelous works are going to take place. And I, I mean, I look at the things that have happened here, we've had, uh, that I know of, and, and I'm going to miss a couple things, we've had two major heart healings. We've had a man who had his hip put back into socket. We had a man that, that was worshiping and a growth fell off his hand. Uh, we had a lady that was, uh, I, I'm not going to say demonically possessed, but certainly was dealing with something and God delivered her right up off of the floor. So we've seen all those signs happen. We've seen all those things happen in, in this place. Um, but I want more. I want more of God, and the only thing I know to do is to die out so that he can live through me and, and so that people can see that. And so I came back. I'll tell you, Friday, I was just I was beside myself. I was at the altar, and, and I just said, God, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to die. I, I don't know what it takes from me to do that. And, and, you know, true to God's form and God's fashion, he started to deal with me that night and kind of gave me vision and understanding and, and peace. And, and I, I got to go back and I got to listen to that Friday night message again because it just spoke so much to me. But I'll tell you, all week I, I have from moment to moment to moment, I have just eaten spiritual steak. And I'm so full and I'm so excited about what God's doing. And, and you know, revival's God's business, but worship is my business. I can worship him. So I'm just, I'm thankful. I'm trying to give you some sort of insight into what happened this week for my wife and I. Uh, good news is we're still married, so praise God. Praise God for that. But anyway, um, so we took off yesterday morning, five something in the morning, and we drove till uh, seven forty-five. We pulled in our our driveway last night, and um, and that's the part where you question if you're still married or not. But yes, we made it. We we did it together, and so I knew this was coming, and so I asked Ryan. I said, "Buddy, can you please preach on Sunday? Because I might just get up and start humming." or stare at people. I don't know what I'll do. So if you wouldn't mind, would you preach? So he said yes. And I I asked him, I said, you know, did God speak to you? Did God speak to you? Because I've always said, you know, if God don't talk to you, you got nothing to say. If God doesn't, if God doesn't speak to you, there's no point in standing behind a pulpit. You you hear the word of God. And he told me that God dealt with him and God spoke to him. And and so I thank the Lord. So I'm going to ask you to stand today. And then uh, I just want you to clap your hands to the Lord Jesus Christ while Ryan comes because we're about to get fed something here this morning. So clap your hands to the Lord. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. You want it? Um, praise the Lord, everybody. The Lord. So good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Um, I don't know, for those of you that remember Brother Hurt that was with us last Sunday, I was talking to him earlier in the week and... Um, he was, say, he was asking about their trip, and, you know, I was, he asked me, you know, if I was preaching. And I said, yeah, you know, my dad's just going to be really tired. And so he took, and previously my dad had said, you know, I may show up at church maybe drooling in a bucket. 
And I told Brother Hurt that if that happens, we would get pictures. So if you see Pastor drooling in a bucket, please, somebody get pictures, because I would love to have that as a memory as well. That would be my new screensaver. Um, and I probably would send that out to a few of his friends as well. <laughs> but no, I, I am so glad that my parents are home. I miss them dearly. Um, I love my dogs, but I can only have so much of a conversation with them. So I am so glad that my parents are home and I have human interaction again. Um, but, you know, like Pastor said, I, do, I feel like the Lord has spoken to me, and I feel this is the word that he has given me for this congregation today. And so if you have your Bibles with you, I'm going to ask you, or if you have your phones, uh, go to Exodus chapter 12, and we're going to start at verse number 1. And again, I'll just say this, so excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning. The Lord is here and just so excited for what he's going to do here this morning. And we just, we love him so much. Amen? Amen. All right. If you're at Exodus chapter 12, why don't you say praise the Lord? Well, that's a little weak. We'll give another second. All right, we're getting there. All right, well, we'll go ahead because it sounds like most phones have stopped scrolling and pages have stopped turning. So Exodus chapter 12, starting at verse 1. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye, and I'll give a little background here. This was the Lord speaking to Moses before the last plague on Egypt. So this is the Lord giving the final commandment to Moses, and he said, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it, according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and then the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden it all with water, but roast with fire his head, with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, of that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Then scrolling down to verse 30, it, this is the follow through. It says, And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt. For there is not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go, serve the Lord as ye have said. Why don't you put your Bibles down? With the help of the Lord, I'd like to preach to you today on the subject of dressed for deliverance. So let's just, before we do anything else, we're going to pray and we're going to put the Lord in the center of this service and we're just going to ask him that his will would be done here today. Lord, we love you so much and we're so thankful for this day. We're so thankful that you're here, that you have come to meet us. And Lord, we want you to receive all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. Let your will be done in this service. We're not here for ourselves, but we're here to draw closer to you. So Lord, draw us closer to you through your word today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank the Lord. So before we go any farther, we'll kind of just recap of how we got to this point in the history of Israel. So when you start out the book, well, actually, I'll go a little bit further back. When we end the book of Genesis, we see Israel starting to come into the land of Egypt to a place called Goshen. Now, Goshen 
is a part of Egypt that is very fertile. It's very lush. It was considered to be perhaps the best part of Egypt, and this was given to the children of Israel. And so when you flip from chapter 50 of Genesis to chapter 1 of Exodus, you start to see a transition take place because it talks about the death of Joseph. And when Joseph was alive, there was a great favor with the people of Israel. They knew Um, because Joseph was alive. But then it goes on to say how Joseph died. And after Joseph died, there came a pharaoh, or it says, I think it says a king, that did not know Joseph. And when this pharaoh saw that the children of Israel waxed great, he got very concerned for his own power, for his own um, self-esteem, I guess you could call it, his own ego. And he was worried that the children of Israel were going to overtake the land. And so that's when he decided, hey, we need to do something about this. So that's when the decision to make Israel slaves, the Bible uses the phrase, put taskmasters over them. I think that's a fancy way of saying they were brought into slavery. And so from that day forward, when we come to this point in history, It's been about 400 years, give or take a few, maybe a few less, maybe a few more. But for these about four, we'll just say about 400 years, it was not easy. It was not pleasant for the children of Israel. They had endured so much, not just week by week, not just once a week, but day by day, hour by hour, perhaps minute by minute. They were in slavery. They were in bondage and things were not pleasant for them. Their tasks were hard. And you know, if they messed up, I'm sure things were made harder for them. There was probably a constant thought of, Lord, when is our deliverance coming? How much longer do we have to dwell in this bondage? You know, when are you going to set us free? And so we now come to this point in history where their deliverance is very nigh. We see the Lord raise up a man named Moses and bring him through the wilderness to this point to stand before Pharaoh and say, let my people go. And so we see the plagues that came upon Egypt as a result of Pharaoh's stubbornness and his hard-heartedness. We see the water that was turned to blood. We see the frogs that came upon the land. We saw the lice. Um, all over the land of Egypt that crawled from dust to cover the land. We saw how wild animals destroyed everything in their path. The pestilence that came upon the animals, the, the boils, which that is probably my least favorite of all of that. The lice and the boils. I'm sorry, I just could not deal with that. Um, you see the fiery hail. You see the locust. You see the darkness. And then you come to the point we're at now where we're talking about the last plague, the death of the firstborn. And when we think of the plagues, we often assume that, hey, Israel didn't have to endure these plagues. They, weren't have to be, they didn't have to go through what the Egyptians faced. They were an entirely different nation. Well, that would be incorrect. Israel did have to go through the plagues. But there came a certain point where... There was a line drawn, and the Lord separated the land of Israel and said, these are my people, and they are not going to go through this. And so we come to this point in history where the Lord is speaking to Moses. He's giving him the final commandment and saying, this is how I am about to set you free. You better get ready to go. And so he was telling the people what to do. He was telling them, this is what you're going to do. This is the type of lamb that you're going to take. This is how you're going to kill it. This is how you're going to dress it. This is how you're going to cook it. This is how you're going to prepare it. And there's so much more. But he also goes on to say, this is how you're to dress. This is what you're to wear. This is what you're to be doing. But then also goes on to say how they were to take the blood of the lamb that they killed and they were to take it and put it on the two doorposts and the post above. And so the Lord was getting them ready to leave. Now think about this. If the Israelites had not seen all these plagues, if they had not endured what they had gone through in these plagues, there might be a chance that they would not believe what Moses said unto them saying, this crazy old guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He, he's just making this all up. This really won't happen. But because they had seen these plagues, because they had endured these plagues, because they had been put through these trials, they're like, you know what? No, this is true. This is the Lord. The Lord is getting ready to do something. And you know what? They understood that our deliverance is coming and we better be ready. And I always say that if I was an Israelite, I would be pestering it all out of Moses saying, am I doing this right? Am I doing this right? Because it's my deliverance that's on the line. It's my life. You know, if I didn't have the blood that was properly applied to my house, my life is on the line. And I would want to make sure that I'm doing everything right. So when we go a little further down in Exodus chapter 12, 
Verse 21, we read, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and, the two, and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into you, unto your house to smite you. Here was the difference between Israel and Egypt. Every firstborn in Egypt must die, which included the Israelites. But wherever there was blood, the firstborn was spared. The firstborn was redeemed. So he, so he did not die, but a lamb died for him. The same is true now. When we come unto the Lord, when we are bought with a price, when we say, you know what, Lord, when we are when we fulfill John chapter 3, where it says being born of the water and of the Spirit, when we fulfill Acts 2.38, where we're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, we have been redeemed by the blood. But the thing is, we can't just say, you know, I've been baptized, I'm fine. We have to constantly live under the power of the blood. We have to submit ourselves to the power of the blood. And so we read that nothing was going to be spared in Egypt that night as the death angel passed over. Any child who was a firstborn without some blood on that doorpost would surely die. There was power in the blood as there is still power in the blood of the Lamb today. And now think about this. You're, you're an Israelite. You're sitting down. You're eating your lamb. You're done eating your lamb. Midnight comes. This angel comes through. And all of a sudden, you hear this. You hear the noise of a weeping and a shrieking and a calling on their false gods. You hear the cry of a desperate mother who has just lost their child. And it was not in isolated places. This cry could be heard from one end of Egypt to the other. It was a very loud cry. The Bible says it was a great cry that went forth. However, you had the Israelites in Goshen. They were eating a lamb with their shoes on their feet and their staff in their hand. They were preparing to leave. And I want you to think about that. There's coming a day where the Lord has instructed us, this is how you're to dress. This is how you're to live. My coming is soon. And there's coming a day where there's going to be a cry from the Lord. There's going to be a trumpet that's going to sound. And we're, those that are ready, those that are living under the power of the blood are going to be taken up with the Lord into the sky. But they are going to be be those that think, you know what, I dressed right, I prepared everything right, but they're not living under the power of the blood. They have not submitted themselves to the power of the blood. So you can look right, you can talk right, you can come to church, you can say all the right things, and you can do all these things and check it off a checklist. But if you're not living under the power of the blood, if you have not submitted yourself to the Lord God's will to be under the power of the blood, then I'm sorry, then that cry, you're going to be the one that is crying. And this is not meant to scare. This is Bible. This is Bible. This is the Lord. This is what the Lord has said. And if it scares you, I'm sorry. That is not my intent. This is what I feel that the Lord has said. We need to be a bride that is dressed to leave. We need to be under the power of the blood every day, day by day. Are we living in accordance to the word of God? Are we submitted to the word of God? Are we submitted to the power of the blood? When we flip over to Matthew chapter 24, it's a very lengthy chapter. And for those of you not familiar with Matthew chapter 24, what it is is the disciples have approached Jesus and said, when is the end of the world going to happen? What is the end of the world going to look like? You know, what should we expect? And so up until... Through many verses of Matthew 24, the Lord is saying, this is what's going to happen. This is what it's going to look like. These are things that you need to look for. These are the signs of what it will look like when my second coming is nigh. So the Lord was preparing them and telling them, hey, look for these things. 
And so in Matthew 24, verse 43, like I said, up until this point, he had been in very great detail telling the disciples of what to look for. But now he was giving them this illustration. In Matthew 24, verse 43, you do not have to turn there. But there we read a parable that Jesus used to illustrate. It reads, but know this, that if the good men or the servant of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would have not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Verse 48, we're going to transition from a faithful to an unfaithful servant. It reads, But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion. And the hypocrites, with the hypocrites, I'm sorry, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So here the Lord was saying the faithful servant will be aware each day of what he is, what he is doing and how beneficial it is for the kingdom. He lives as though his master may show up any moment. He does his job even though he might understand, hey, my master might not come back for years he still lives as though his master could show up at any moment. But the unfaithful servant, the foolish servant, lives as though his master has, will speak when, his coming is, when he is returning. He is, has an appointed time when he is returning. He will slack off. He will goof off. He will not do his job. He is unfaithful. Jesus had one intent in mind as he gave this warning that any servant of his, that includes us, we are his servants of us who reads this, will be constantly aware of the stewardship that he has placed in our lives and just, aware, just as aware that his return is imminent. One of his main purposes here was never let it get to your head that he might delay his coming. To reinforce his admonition, he gave this parable to encourage us. This, I'm sorry, I'm getting tongue-tied here, but he's, he's reminding us, you need to constantly be washing, constantly be ready. We need to constantly be dressed and ready to go. Just as the Israelites prepared themselves to leave, we need to be ready. My, I had a teacher in, in Bible college, his name was Kelsey Griffin, and he tells a story, and so a little preface about it. In 1988, there was a book written, and maybe those of you who were here in 1988 will remember a book called 88 Reasons Why the Lord Will Come Back in 1988. And so it was basically saying that the Lord, I think, was going to come back like September 1st of 1988 or something like that. And then obviously he didn't come back that day. So they decided they were going to revise it and then they made like a 1989 and so on and so on. And so somebody asked my teacher um, what he thought about this book. He, they said, do you think it's true? Do you think this will happen? He said, no, because everyone is expecting him. And when he, he comes, when nobody will expect it. And you know what? When we look at the children of Israel for such a long time, when you read it, you know, you read it in Judges. You read it in First and Second Kings. You read it in Samuel. Their attitude was they were warned over and over, yet when the time of disaster came, they cried as though as they had never been warned. They lived for the present. They forgot the promises and the warnings of the future. And for many of those living on this earth, it will be the same when Jesus comes again. They will not even be thinking of his appearance but it is unto them that look for him that will be the return the second time. I'm sorry. He will return the second time without sin. He will come again. And this is a great principle which applies to every one of us. Jesus is coming back. Yes. And we're all going to stand before the Lord. Yes. Regardless of your age, your gender, you know, 
whatever, you're going to stand before the Lord. But think about this. We need to live our lives in the light that we are not only going to stand before the Lord, but we are going to stand in the presence of Christ. We are going to stand in the presence and the ruler of the maker of the universe. Regardless whether Christ comes in a hundred years or whether he comes today, you and I will stand in his presence. If you are saved, you will give him account of your life to see if you receive a reward. If you are lost, you will stand there to be judged. Therefore, every person should live his light in fact, in the light of the fact that we are going to stand in the presence of Christ. And we know we talked about an unfaithful servant and a faithful servant. When, when we look at the biblical definition of marriage, I'm sorry, not definition, but when we look at marriage in the Bible, the only reasons in the Bible listed for divorce are as an unfaithful spouse. There is no other reason listed for a divorce in the Bible except for fornication, or in other words, your spouse was unfaithful. And if we are, our bride, if we are the bride of Christ, there is coming a day when we are going to stand before our bridegroom, and he is going to open the books, and he is going to say, Have you, my bride, been faithful to me? If we have not been faithful, it is a reason for divorce, and that means eternal separation. When we flip, when we look in the Gospels, we read of many parables of the Lord talking about weddings. And one of the reasons, one of the particular weddings we read about is a Galilean wedding. And why a Galilean wedding? Very simple. Jesus was a Galilean. I mean, I mean, I know Bible college paying off right there. But anyway, we read of this Galilean wedding. And in this wedding, it was very unusual. It was different from other cultures. When you look at the Middle Eastern culture, when you look at the cultures surrounding Israel and that the nations all around, it is the, the groom has all the power. The man has all the power. The groom's family has all the power. In the Galilean wedding, it is the bride that has the choice. It is the bride that holds all the power. When there is a proposal given in a Galilean wedding process, the groom comes to the bride. It is a very public thing. It is not done in private. It is very public. And the groom comes to the bride and pours a cup of wine and hands it to the bride. And if she drinks from the cup, that is signifying this. it is an acceptance of this proposal. And if she pushes it away, it's a way of saying, no, thank you. And like I said, this is very different. This is unique because in every other culture surrounding this area, it is the groom that gets to decide, hey, you're going to marry me. Or it is an arranged marriage. So for the bride to have all power, it is a very unusual thing. And so after the, if the bride drinks of this cup and accepts this proposal, the bride and the groom will then go their separate ways. The bride will go to prepare herself a wedding gown. She will go to pr- gather the materials that are needed for this wedding dress. The groom will go and start building a house for him and a soon-to-be bride. But the thing is, as the groom is building, as the bride is preparing her gown, the only one that knows that the wedding day, the, one, the only one that knows when the groom will go get the bride is the groom's father. Not even the groom knows, not, the bride doesn't know either. It is an unanticipated moment when the groom's father will say, go get your bride. But as we talked about, the bride is gathering these materials for her wedding dress. And as she gathers these materials, as her dress is complete, every day she must be dressed and ready. Because as we said, she does not know when her groom is coming. She does not know what hour her groom is coming. She must be ready to go. She must be faithful. For her groom could come at any hour of the night. And such is our duty every day. We need to be gathering the materials for our wedding gown. You know, how do we do that? We have his word. We have our time in prayer. We have fasting. We have all these different ways that we are to draw closer to God and saying, I'm preparing myself for my bridegroom. I'm preparing myself for the day that I'm going to stand before you. I'm preparing myself to meet you because I want to be found faithful. We read about in Matthew 7 how it says, where the Lord says, depart from me, ye worker of iniquity. I never knew you. But it also talks about, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But it's to those that have prepared, to those that have been waiting, to those that have been watching, to those that have applied the blood to their lives and said, you know what? I am ready to meet my groom. 
there is a fable which tells of three apprentice devils who were coming to this earth to finish their apprenticeship. They were talking to Satan, the chief of the devils, about their plans to tempt and ruin men. The first said, I will tell them there is no God. Satan said, that will not delude many, for they know that there is a God. The second said, I will tell men there is no hell. Satan answered, you will deceive no one, for they know that there is a hell for sin. The third said, I will tell men there is no hurry. Go, said Satan, and you will ruin them by the thousand. The most dangerous of all delusions is that there is plenty of time. The most dangerous day in a man's life is when he learns there is a word called tomorrow. There are things which, not be put, which must not be put off, for no man knows if for him tomorrow will ever come. I go back to this. There is coming a day when the trumpet will sound and the Lord will break through the clouds. And those who are ready, those who have been faithful, those who have applied the blood to their lives, who have submitted themselves to the word of God, who have submitted themselves to the authority of the bridegroom, they will go meet him. But just as there is a great cry in Egypt, there will be a great cry in this earth. There will be those saying, Lord, give me one more chance. Lord, you didn't tell me I wasn't ready. How was I to know that your coming was today? How was I to know that this was going to be happening? I didn't know. Give me another chance, Lord. And it's going to be filling the earth. But the thing is, the Lord will not hear it. Because that time of grace is done. Those who have been faithful have earned their reward. Those who have put themselves under the power of the blood have earned their reward. Those who were waiting faithfully for their bridegroom have earned their reward. When I was in Bible school, there was one year where we had our, um, our prospective students come. We call it college days. And it was kind of a busy time for the students. You, you were helping host it, and you were help putting on all the different events for this. And so after, it was about a three-day event, and it ended on a Saturday. Well, the Sunday after, there was a group of us students who were going on a tour to a church in Wisconsin to help do some Sunday school things. And so we had to leave a little bit earlier in the morning in order to get there. And so the guy in charge, he said, we're leaving at 7.30. We're leaving at this particular time. You know, we're in the van. We're getting ready to go. So I remember it's like, yeah, 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 you know, I'll be ready. So I remembered, I set my alarm, I think I set two or three alarms, and when they went off, it's like, you know what, I have plenty of time, this will be fine. Well, I remember I turned off my last alarm, but then all of a sudden I hear my phone ringing again, and this time it's a phone call, and it's from the guy, and he's saying, hey, it's 7.30, where are you? And I realized it was past 7.30, and I'm like, I need five minutes, and I'll be right there. So Thank the Lord, I did not have to dress in a suit and tie. I threw on some clean pants. I threw on a t-shirt. I grabbed my socks, my shoes, my belt, my toothbrush, my toothpaste, and my flannel shirt, and I ran out the door. And as I ran out the door, he looks up, and his eyes probably got as wide as you'll ever see as he sees me carrying all these things out to the van. And he didn't even know that I wasn't ready to go. And so from that day forward, every time we went on a trip, there was, make sure Ryan's ready. Make sure Ryan's ready. Someone go check on Ryan. Make sure that he's awake. You make that mistake once, and you're labeled for life. And so anyway, to relay this point is there was a call given to me, though, saying, are you ready? There was an advance notice saying, hey, we're getting ready to go. Are you dressed? Are you ready? But there's coming a day, like I said, there's going to be a call given. And the Lord is not going to be, are you ready? It's going to be, we need to be ready. There's going to be no warning. We have signs and we have seasons that the Lord has given us. And he, that is our way of knowing I have to prepare to be ready. Because I don't know about you, but I want to be ready. I don't want to be left behind on this earth. I don't want to spend an eternity separated from the Lord. I remember a couple weeks ago I had a dream, and in this dream the Lord had either come back or he was about to come back. And I remember in this dream I felt this intense separation from the Lord. And I woke up and I said, Lord, I don't ever want to feel that again. 
But that is what it's going to feel like. There's going to be no love. There's going to be no grace. There's going to be no mercy on this earth when the Lord's going to come back. And if we're not under the power of the blood, if we're not submitted to him, if we're not right with him, if we're not being faithful to him, that separation is what we're going to feel. Pastor talks about how the Lord spoke to him about Adam and Eve in the garden and how he must have felt when he had to kick them out of the garden. Well, I asked him this. I said, you know, what if the Lord kicked them out? But then he realized, you know, this is his bride, right? Adam and Eve are his bride. And he's longing for the day that he can be with his bride again like he was in the Garden of Eden. The, the, our bridegroom, the Lamb of God, laid down his life for us. He shed his blood to be with his bridegroom because he realized this was the only way to be with his bridegroom. He loved you so much. When no one else was willing to pay the price, he came down, robed himself in flesh, and laid down his life for you. The nails in his hands and his feet, the crown of thorns upon his head. This is what your bridegroom did for you. And so for us to say, you know what? No, I don't have to serve you. I don't have to love you. You're right, you don't. But think of what he did for you. Think of what he sacrificed for you. Think of what he gave up for you. He left his throne in heaven to come upon this earth where he was beaten, where he was bruised, where he was mocked. This was our bridegroom. This is the man who loves us. In a world where we are trying to find love, there is a constant love that is calling out and saying, my bride, are you ready? I love you so much and I can't wait to be with you. But it's up to us to make the decision of I I'm ready. I want to serve you. I want to love you. I'm going to put myself under the power of the blood. And so I'm going to ask us to stand today. And here's what I want us to do. I'm going to ask us to gather around front. And here's what I'm going to ask us to do. As I want us to take some time and examine yourself and say, is there anything in my life that would cause me to be separated? Is there anything that if the Lord came back right now that he would find me unfaithful for? Is there anything that I am doing that is not pleasing to my bridegroom? Oh Lord. Lord, search us. Lord, search us. We are your bride. Lord, what, what can I do to serve you? What is in there in my life that is keeping me from you? Oh, Lord, search me and know me. You are my bridegroom, and I don't want to ever be separated from you. Oh, just going to ask everybody to gather around this altar real quick. I know we do this a lot, but it's just only, we're just trying to surrender to the Lord. So if you could make your way to the front. I praise you, Jesus. Mm. Mm. I praise you, Jesus. The only reason um, let me back up. There, there's a lot of messages that are being preached this morning from churches where the pastor wants to give the congregation, hey, you need to feel good. God loves you. God bless you. I mean, we all want that. But the reason for a message like this is because God loves you so deeply and he's trying to make the earth aware of what is coming, that there is coming judgment. 
And God is going to separate the lambs from the goats. He tells us that. And he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The story he's preaching about the, the blood over the, the lentil of the door, if you study that out a little more, you're going to find that they first they killed a lamb, and they took the blood and they put it over the doorpost, and then they ate the lamb. And so when you do that, in the New Testament, you do the exact same thing. You put the blood on the outside, and you put the lamb on the inside. And the only way the blood can be applied in the New Testament is you have to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And then you have to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And you have the blood on the outside, and you have the lamb on the inside, just like it was back in the days of, of Moses. And I'm telling you that there is a cry that is going into the earth. The Lord has spoken numerous times and said, I'm coming back quickly get yourself ready. I've never been so shaken and so stirred like I am after this week. I just want to die out and allow the things of God to flow through me. So I, I'm, I know I asked you to come to the front. I, I know I asked you to do that. But this is your moment. I want you to reach out to God right now. And, and here's, here's uh, just you can pray whatever you want, but just say, God, I need you to search me, and I need you to speak to my heart and speak to my mind. Is there anything, Lord, that I am allowing into my life that is separating me from you? Because, God, if that separation is there, then, Lord, it's somehow it's got to go. You've got to give me revelation. You've got to talk to my heart. You've got to cast this thing down, and you've got to cast it out. And, God, if you'll speak to my heart, Lord, I'll turn from it. I'll leave it behind. I'll get it out of my life. Lord Jesus, right now, I repent. Lord, is there anything in my life? Lord, you show me. You stir me. You convict me. And God, if you show it to me, I will leave it behind. Lord, I pray right now, Cause every heart in this place, Lord, to put the blood on the outside. Lord, if we haven't, Lord, repented of our sins, cause repentance to flow from our mouth right now. If, Lord, we haven't, Lord, been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and God, I pray, drive us to a place, Lord, where, Lord, that's all, Lord, that we can think of. God, if we don't have the Lamb on the inside, if we haven't been birthed in the Spirit, Lord, like Your Word says, You must be born of the water and the Spirit, for that's what it takes to see the kingdom of God. Lord, if we haven't allowed that into our life, then God, convict us. Lord, let us, Lord, speak forth those things, God. Let us declare those things. I pray right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray something I've never prayed before. But God, if our heart's not right, then, Lord, don't let us walk out of this service and feel good about ourselves. Well, bless God, He, he preached good this week, man. He yelled really good. Well, Lord, I want it to impact my life. And so, God, I pray if we walk out of here, I pray, God, and there's some baggage that we have that we're not supposed to have, then I pray, Lord, you would shake us and stir us like we've never been shaken and stirred before. Let sleep flee from us. Lord, let our hearts, Lord, melt in the presence of God. Let our desires be unto you, Almighty God, like they never have been before. Lord, I'm telling you, I stand here before you and I just say this, I love you, Jesus. But God, if there's something that I'm hiding in my heart, if there's something, Lord, a place that I haven't submitted and surrendered to you, God, I'm asking you to reveal it because, Lord, I'm just telling you right now, I want to give it to you. I want to give you that. Lord, I pray all of this in Jesus' name. I pray it all in Jesus' name. Why don't we just clap our hands to the Lord right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And then I got a favor to ask you. Why don't you uh, take a second, and if you're mingling around, and I would invite you to mingle. I'd like you to mingle. But just tell Ryan thank you from hearing from the Lord because, man, it's just good to hear the voice of God. God bless you. You're dismissed. And, and uh, thank you so much for being in the house of the Lord this morning. God bless our last timers this morning.